The system suggests checking out the shop for helpful items. Heijun thinks to himself, what's the point when he can barely afford anything? Then it occurs to him that he might be able to exchange all his points for cash and hire some hunters. When he sees the shop, he's surprised by a flash offer. He can buy a Kaini replica for 800 points. Heijun wonders what this Kaini replica is. He's shocked to see that it can only be used twice and costs a whopping 8 million won. The Kaini replica is a copy of the legendary Helm of Hades, an artifact that completely conceals the wearer's appearance and presence. Its duration is 30 minutes and it's available for two uses. Heijun thinks to himself that it's exactly what he needs right now, but he also considers it a total ripoff. After purchasing it, Heijun grumbles to himself, complaining about those lousy good-for-nothing Greek gods. He declares that once this delivery is done, he's finished taking any more of their orders. The Kaini replica appears in front of him, but he fails to catch it as it materializes in midair and falls to the ground. Shocked, Heijun yells about his 8 million one. He quickly gets off his scooter and retrieves the helm from the ground. After dusting it off, he puts it on and walks comfortably past the guards. One of the guards feels a sudden breeze and asks another guard why it's windy all of a sudden. The other guard replies, telling him to stay sharp. Meanwhile, the Yongwon Guild plans to raid this dungeon later, as Heijun comfortably makes his way inside. Heijun is curious, wondering who on earth would have lunch in such a creepy place. But he doesn't really care, and continues further into the dungeon. He passes through many eerie locations, and encounters numerous ferocious monsters. As an ordinary delivery man without a hunter's license, a contracted mythical creature, physical abilities, supernatural powers, or special skills, Heijun somehow manages against all odds to become the first person ever to reach the deepest depths of Tartarus. Upon finally reaching his destination safely, he sees that no one is there. He looks left and right to find anyone around, feeling relieved that he made it within 30 minutes, ensuring he won't be turned into a pig. Heijun calls out, asking if anybody is home because their delivery has arrived. Suddenly, he notices glowing eyes ahead of him. Surprised, Heijun wonders what the heck that is. But then he becomes really scared upon seeing a huge three-headed dog standing in front of him. Terrified by this monster, Heijun thinks to himself that he should have just chosen to become a pig. He closes his eyes and thinks, is this the end for him? But he still has 199 points left. This sucks, he thinks. He spent all that money on this stupid helm and the only thing he treated himself to was a big plate of black bean noodles with seafood. Suddenly, Heijun remembers that he can use the helm one more time. But before he can activate it, the three-headed dog starts to attack. Heijun realizes it's too late, but luckily, someone comes to his rescue. A little girl stops the three-headed dog, telling it not to eat anything dirty. The dog freezes in place at the sound of her voice. Heijun slowly opens his eyes and turns his head toward the voice. He's surprised to see a beautiful little girl and wonders what she's doing on the bottom floor of Tartarus. The dangerous three-headed dog becomes as docile as a regular dog in front of her. She assures Heijun that he has nothing to worry about because her dog doesn't bite. Heijun is shocked, but he realizes that this little girl looks exactly like her mother, Demeter. He thinks to himself that the dog may not bite, but it could still swallow him whole. Heijun approaches the girl to tell her he has a delivery for her, but before he can finish his sentence, he hears a voice calling out, asking Persephone where she went. Heijun is stunned to see a dangerous-looking man appear. The man sees the little girl playing with Cerberus and entertaining a mortal who dared to tread into the underworld, which he, Hades, rules. Heijun is scared and tries to explain the situation, but his entire body trembles with fear upon seeing Hades, the fearsome god of the underworld. Hades tells Heijun that he is the first living human in several thousand years to venture into the afterlife since Orpheus. After saying this, Hades uses his death magic and black strings wrap around Heijun's neck, causing him to struggle for breath. Hades explains that Orpheus came to rescue his deceased wife, but he thinks Heijun has come to steal his helm. However, Hades is surprised to find the helm he confiscates from Heijun is actually a fake. The little girl approaches Hades and says that since Heijun made it all the way here, shouldn't they at least hear him out? Taking her advice, Hades releases Heijun and demands that he state his intentions. Why does a mere mortal dare trespass upon this domain? In a trembling voice, Heijun pleads with Hades to have mercy on him, explaining that he is just there to make a delivery. Hades is surprised to hear about a delivery and asks if Heijun has something for him. The Lord of the Underworld. Heijun clarifies that the delivery is not for Hades, but for his daughter. His wife has sent something for her. Both Hades and the little girl are puzzled and ask what his wife sent for their daughter and why a mere mortal like Heijun is making this delivery instead of Hermes. Trembling with fear, Heijun says he doesn't know all the details and hands over the lunchbox that Demeter had asked him to deliver. 
the little girl immediately recognizes it as a lunchbox made by her mother. Seeing the lunchbox, Hades asks Heijun, didn't he say his wife requested this delivery? Heijun replies yes, she asked him to bring this to Hades' daughter. Hades then explains that the lunchbox was actually made by his mother-in-law, not his wife. Heijun is surprised to hear this. He then asks Hades where his wife is right now. Upon hearing the answer, Heijun exclaims, that's disgusting, Hades is way too old for her. Heijun suddenly covers his mouth with his hand to prevent himself from saying anything more. Realizing that he spoke without thinking, Hades, furious, demands to know what Heijun just said to him, the lord of the underworld. Trembling with fear, Heijun begs Hades to wait, claiming he can explain, but he knows he's in grave danger. Hades' expression becomes serious, as if he's ready to kill Heijun. But after hearing Heijun's words, Hades suddenly laughs loudly. Heijun is bewildered, wondering what just happened. Hades says he can't remember the last time he had such a good laugh. He never imagined that a mere human would dare insult him. Hades, the lord of the underworld. He then asks Heijun for his name. Heijun introduces himself as Heijun Lee. Hades declares that since Heijun's antics amused him, he'll pardon his insolence this time. However, he warns him that if he dares mock him again, he should be prepared for dire consequences. Scared, Heijun quickly agrees. Hades gives Heijun his payment and asks him to thank his mother-in-law for the lunchbox. Suddenly, a system notification pops up in front of Heijun. He is surprised to see the message informing him that the delivery is complete and he's earned 10,000 points. He's also been awarded an extra 5,000 points by Hades, the god of the underworld, bringing his current total to 15,999 points. Hades also returns Heijun's helm. In front of Hades, however, the helm is nothing more than a mere toy. Still staring at the system notification, Heijun collects himself and thanks Hades. Meanwhile, at the first floor of the dungeon, Doyun Ha, the newest member of Yongwon Guild, is fighting a dragon. He is the captain of Team 1, with a global ranking of 100, and a combat type hunter. He is fighting the dragon, but it's a really tough opponent. The dragon uses its roar attack and pushes everyone back. However, one of them sees an opportunity and attacks from behind. He uses his slash sew technique and kills the dragon with just one move. After the fight, he is utterly exhausted. He approaches Doyun, who sustained minor injuries from the dragon's attack, and tells him he did a great job. Finally, they have cleared the first floor of Tartarus. His name is Xiongjun Park, and he is the guildmaster of Yongwan Guild, ranked 3 globally, and a mythical type hunter. Everyone is thrilled to have cleared the first floor of the Tartarus dungeon. The guildmaster congratulates everyone, saying they all did a fantastic job. It's all thanks to each of them that Yongwan Guild now holds the record for reaching the farthest point in Tartarus. Finally, the guildmaster breathes a sigh of relief. Doyun tells the guildmaster he truly thought they were goners. The guildmaster replies, no matter what anyone else says, Doyun is the real MVP today. He doesn't know what their guild would do without him. Moved by this, Doyun says he'll follow the guildmaster to the ends of the earth. Meanwhile, a guild member is harvesting the dragon core. The guildmaster asks her to take it easy, saying they can do it later. Her name is Arun Beck, and she is the deputy guildmaster of Yongwan Guild, ranked 17 globally, and also a combat type hunter. She agrees, but continues her work. The guildmaster understands her eagerness to collect as many mana stones as possible, but she suddenly hears a sound approaching them. She informs the guildmaster that something is headed their way, and quickly, everyone gets alert as the guildmaster unsheathes his sword and thinks to himself that this is bad. None of them have enough energy to even defend themselves. He asks everyone to get into position. Arun alerts everyone that it seems there are still more monsters left and it's approaching quickly. Startled by this, the guildmaster urges everyone to remain calm, assuring them that he and the deputy guildmaster will hold the monsters off. He instructs everyone that if things get too intense, he wants them all to flee. Hearing this, everyone gets angry with the guildmaster and declares they will fight alongside him and follow him to the ends of the earth. The guildmaster is delighted to hear this and says, You goofs! Ah, Arun tells the guildmaster that the monster is coming closer, but the dense fog makes it impossible to see clearly. Suddenly, they spot a massive shadow approaching through the mist. However, it's not a monster, but Hajun Lee, our protagonist. He is surprised to see so many people in front of him and asks them to step aside, saying he almost ran someone over. He then notices the dragon carcass and asks if they all took down this monster, praising them and saying that's awesome. Heijun notes it's fortunate for him because his helm's effects were about to wear off anyway. He warns them that beyond this point, there are a bunch of monsters wielding black magic, so they should be ready to fend off magical attacks. He wishes them luck with their raid and starts walking toward home. Everyone is shocked and wonders who that guy was. 
150 million. When measured in years, it could take you back to the era of dinosaurs. It's a number nearly three times the population of Korea. Assuming you earn 3,001 per delivery, you'd need to complete 50,000 deliveries to reach that total, which is the exact amount Hajun would have in cash if he exchanged all his points. Hajun stares at the system window, laughing, thinking he could admire that number all day. Of course, he was nearly turned into a pig, almost eaten by a three-headed dog after narrowly escaping death, and then nearly strangled to death by the god of the underworld himself. He's been through too much and is exhausted, but in the face of 150 million won, none of that matters. Not when he's banked over a hundred grand. Heijun smiles, feeling hungry for more. From this moment on, he'll do whatever it takes to complete as many deliveries as he can. But first, he needs to eat something because he's starving. Hajun wonders what he should eat, perhaps some chicken and beer. Meanwhile, on the other side, Yongwon Guild's guildmaster organizes a press conference and thanks everyone for attending. That wraps up today's press conference with Yongwon Guild's guildmaster, Hunter Shongjun Park. Doyan asks the guildmaster if he's finally done with the reporters. The guildmaster, who feels very tired, replies that ever since their guild cleared the first floor, he hasn't been able to catch a break. Now, he's got to go see the chairman of the Hunter Association. Doyun acknowledges that things are hectic, but asks if the guildmaster happened to mention that guy during the press conference, the man who roams around Tartarus on his scooter. The guildmaster replies that he didn't mention him, not yet. Since they're still in the dark about who that was, he thought it best not to bring it up. The guildmaster considers it a major oversight on his part, as he was too exhausted from the battles to even think about pursuing him. Doyun reassures him that it's fine, they're gathering black box footage from the cars in that area. Still confused, they wonder who this person could be and speculate if he could have been a monster. He showed up suddenly beyond the first floor, a point only their guild has reached. Aaron explains that he was wearing an odd helm while riding a scooter. Doyun suggests maybe he was a hunter equipped with enchanted gear. He vaguely remembers him mentioning something about the next floor. The guildmaster advises them not to worry too much. Their goal is to raid the dungeon, not figure out who this mystery person is. Suddenly, he remembers and asks Doyun to head to Suwon. The guildmaster was planning to assign the new recruits to smelt all their weapons, but they need ores only found in the mining dungeon there. Doyun, surprised, says he has practice with his teammates tonight. The guildmaster tells him to leave that to Eren. Since Doyun has a driver's license, he should go. Doyun agrees, asking what kind of ore the guildmaster needs him to get. The guildmaster replies that it's called Celestial Steel. Meanwhile, Hajun's chicken wings and beer have arrived, and he can't wait to dig in. But just as he's about to start eating, he receives a notification on his phone. Hajun jumps up, grabs his phone, and sees that he has a new delivery request. Smiling, he thinks the chicken can wait. However, Hajun knows he can't keep a god waiting. Suddenly, a flash of light appears in front of him, and in the next moment, he finds himself teleported to the realm of the gods. Surprised, Hajun realizes he's arrived at Hephaestus's home. He thinks to himself that Hephaestus has already lined him up for another delivery. Honestly, he's the best customer Heijun has ever had. However, Heijun then realizes that in his hurry, he left all his gear and scooter behind. He wonders what he should do now. Suddenly, someone calls his name from behind, startling him. Heijun turns toward the voice and sees Hephaestus. He asks the god what he's doing out here and why he isn't inside. To Heijun's shock, Hephaestus begins crying and says he was kicked out. Heijun is stunned and asks why Hephaestus was kicked out and what happened. Hephaestus explains that he and his brother Dionysus occasionally get together for a little feast and drinks. But his wife caught him drinking and kicked him out of the house, telling him if he was going to drink like that, he should do it elsewhere and not even bother coming home. Dionysus bolted immediately, leaving poor Hephaestus stranded. Hajun is astounded, thinking to himself, how is this pathetic guy mythical? He acts more like a human than Hajun himself does. Responding sympathetically, Heijun says he feels for Hephaestus and asks what the god would like him to deliver. With a sad face, Hephaestus asks if Heijun can bring him something to eat and drink. His wife kicked him out before he could try the food, and now he's starving to death. Not that he'd actually die since he's a god. Hephaestus even begged his sister Hebe for help, but she turned him down, saying she was completely out of nectar for the month. So now Hephaestus only has Heijun left to rely on. After hearing this, Heijun asks if Hephaestus wants him to fetch something to eat and drink. However, he's really confused and wonders to himself what gods even eat anyway. He asks Hephaestus what he'd like. Hephaestus says anything will do, but if he had to pick, any kind of meat with some alcohol would be good. Heijun agrees and asks for a moment to go find something. He uses his phone to head back to Earth to get food for Hephaestus, still in disbelief that he's dealing with these kinds of situations now. 
A short while later, Hajin returns with the chicken wings and beer that he had originally bought for himself. He says to Hephaestus that he initially got this food for himself, but he's happy to share it if the god would like some. Hephaestus is surprised to see Heijun back and asks what's in his hands. Heijun replies that it's chicken and beer. This combo is called chimek, and it's a popular Korean dish, combining the words chicken and mekju, which is Korean for beer. Hephaestus is intrigued by the word kimek, but when he tries the beer, he exclaims to Heijun that in his entire life, he doesn't think he's ever had such fine and refreshing beer. Heijun is happy that Hephaestus likes it. However, the god is initially disappointed by the size of the bird meat. But after taking one bite, he's shocked and tells Heijun it's the best meat he has ever tasted. Heijun wonders to himself if this guy is really mythical. Hephaestus thanks him and promises to reward Heijun generously for the food. Surprised, Heijun asks what the reward will be. Hephaestus tells him to check. Suddenly, Heijun receives a system notification that the delivery is complete and he's been awarded 15,000 points by Hephaestus, bringing his current points to a total of 30,000. Heijun is stunned by this huge reward. He basically just got paid 150 million won for delivering some chicken. Hephaestus tells Heijun that if there's anything he needs help with, don't hesitate to ask. He'll assist Heijun with anything. After hearing this, Heijun thinks to himself what a lovable dude Hephaestus is. He could hug the god until his ribs break, and even attempts to embrace him. Hephaestus asks what's gotten into Heijun. Suddenly they hear a voice asking, Sweetheart, are you drinking again in a place like this? The beautiful goddess approaching is revealed to be Hephaestus' wife. Heijun is astonished to see her, with tears coming to his eyes as he says he's never laid eyes on someone that beautiful before. He then wonders how she ended up married to this sorry excuse for a mythical being. Heijun then realizes he somehow ended up on his knees without noticing. Hephaestus tells his wife that he's only out here because she told him to leave and take his drinking elsewhere. Hephaestus' wife becomes angry and says in a stern tone, Oh how silly of her, he's absolutely right. Seeing them argue, Hejun tells Hephaestus that he owes her an apology and that he's completely in the wrong here. Hephaestus responds that all right, if even Hejun agrees with her, he'll apologize. Upon realizing this is the Hejun Lee she's heard about, Hephaestus' wife introduces herself, saying it's nice to meet him and that she's Aphrodite. She apologizes for her husband's behavior and any inconvenience he may have caused Hejun. With a goofy grin, Hejun says it's no problem at all and that he's just grateful Hephaestus hires him for his delivery services. Hephaestus then asks Heijun if he could deliver something for him right away. Hesitant to answer at first, Heijun listens, as Aphrodite adds that Hephaestus has told her so much about Heijun and says he really knows how to get the job done. Feeling encouraged, Heijun gets excited at the praise from the goddess and says of course, he's Heijun Li, delivery man to the gods. They can count on him to deliver anything. Pleased, Hephaestus says, wonderful, he knew he could rely on Heijun. He explains there's this material he needs for his next smelting project. When Heijun sees the delivery location, he's surprised to find it's in Suwon City, and the item requested is Celestial Steel. A moment after receiving the delivery request from Hephaestus, Heijun arrives at his destination, this time needing to collect Celestial Steel from the Saori Mines. He can feel his heart pounding as he prepares to enter another dungeon. Before accepting the delivery, when Hephaestus asked him to deliver Celestial Steel, Heijun had no idea what it was. After doing some research, he was shocked to learn that he would need to obtain it from inside a dungeon. Hesitant, he told Hephaestus that he didn't think he could go through with it. When the god asked what was wrong, Heijun explained that he nearly died the last time he went into a dungeon for Demeter's delivery. Hephaestus asked what happened there. Heijun said that since he's not a hunter, he can't really fight off dungeon monsters. He used an artifact called a Kani replica which helped him navigate without being detected. But he's used it all up now, so it's basically just a regular helm at this point. After hearing this, Hephaestus thought to himself, a helm that's no longer usable? He asked Heijun to give it to him so he could fix it up. Heijun was surprised and asked what Hephaestus meant. The god said that he's Hephaestus, the god of blacksmiths. Any metal or gear that passes through his hands becomes a mythical treasure. He told Heijun to bring him anything he has, and he'll fix it up for him. Now in the present, the helm Heijun could no longer use has been transformed into a mythical treasure by Hephaestus. He can now use it whenever he wants. Heijun puts the enhanced helm on and heads towards the dungeon entrance. As he enters, he's surprised to see so many people there already. He thinks to himself that this dungeon is popular and all, but seriously, this crowd is too much for him to handle. And here he thought monsters would be the main issue. He'll need to go much deeper into the dungeon if he wants to extract anything worthwhile with all these people around. Meanwhile, Yongwan guild member Doyun has also come to the Sori mines to collect celestial steel. 
He's currently taking a break and enjoying some snacks. 30 minutes later, after venturing a bit further inside, Heijun finally finds a spot with no one else around. But as he goes deeper, the terrain becomes bumpier. At least now he's starting to spot some minerals though. He just needs to find that celestial steel. It's not a gemstone, but rather a chunk of metal that emits a crimson glow. Heijun is curious and wonders how much farther he'll have to go to find it. As he ventures deeper, he suddenly encounters a skeleton monster that nearly strikes him. Luckily, Heijun reacts just in time to save himself from the attack. But unfortunately, in the chaos, his scooter hits a rock and gets damaged. Heijun is furious, thinking to himself that this is all because of that stupid skeleton. Why did he freak out so much when it can't even see him right now thanks to his helm? And now his poor scooter is damaged too. However, he isn't too worried, as he figures he's earning millions of won from these deliveries, so he can easily buy a new scooter. A moment later, Heijun sees a bright light glowing in front of him, and he knows this is what he's been searching for, the celestial steel. He parks his scooter and approaches the glowing mineral deposit, overjoyed to have finally found it. However, Heijun then wonders how he's actually supposed to extract and bring it back. He tries uprooting the celestial steel with his bare hands, but it doesn't budge at all no matter how much effort he puts in. After exhausting himself trying everything he can think of, Heijun still can't manage to dislodge the stubborn celestial steel. Finally giving up, he thinks to himself, now what the heck is he supposed to do? Suddenly, a system notification appears in front of Heijun, asking if he needs some assistance with his delivery. It suggests he check out the shop, as he might stumble upon items there that could be helpful. Seeing the message, Heijun thinks to himself, does this system take him for some kind of chump? However, when he reluctantly checks the shop, he's amazed to find an item called the Delver's Pickaxe, which helps mine any mineral precisely once without fail. It has one use and costs 4,700 points. Heijun is left speechless at the exorbitant price. He wonders to himself, what sort of pickaxe costs 47 million won? And it's single use only two? Is that thing made of pure gold or something? Suddenly, Heijun remembers seeing a rental booth near the dungeon entrance earlier. He says aloud that he's not going to buy that overpriced pickaxe. There's a rental booth that costs next to nothing to use. No way is he wasting that much money on a measly single-use tool. Heijun declares he'd rather pay for more gas for his scooter. After saying that, he heads back to where he parked it. But seeing the damaged condition his vehicle is in, he realizes it's too much of a hassle to go all the way back to the rental booth now. Should he just bite the bullet and buy that stupidly expensive Delver's pickaxe? Heijun debates with himself. Ultimately, he decides to go ahead and spend the 4,700 points, thinking that he'll just complete this delivery and include the pickaxe's cost in Hephaestus's delivery fee. The god can surely afford it. Heijun uses the Delver's pickaxe on the celestial steel deposit, and with a single strike, the large chunk of crimson metal comes free from the ground. The pickaxe then disappears into thin air, its one use completed. When Heijun tries to lift the celestial steel to load it onto his scooter, he's astonished, thinking to himself, why the heck is this thing so damn heavy? He manages to carry it and secures it to his vehicle, wishing he could just teleport straight to Olympus from inside the dungeon. But suddenly, Right after securing the celestial steel, a massive stone golem appears behind Heijun. He's shocked as the imposing monster starts roaring loudly. Meanwhile, on the other side of the dungeon, Doyun is busy fighting off a skeleton monster himself. After defeating it, he hears a strange noise echoing and wonders what it could be. Doyun listens carefully for any sound of footsteps approaching and prepares himself for a potential attack. But then he notices a light coming his way. It's Heijun's scooter headlight. Heijun yells at Doyun to get out of the way as he speeds toward him. Doyun recognizes him, exclaiming that it's the same guy from Tartarus before. But before he can ask any more questions, Heijun warns him to run now if he values his life. The delivery man then zooms away, leaving a confused Doyun behind. Doyun wonders what Heijun meant by that ominous warning. When he looks behind him, he's shocked to see the huge stone golem fast approaching. He starts running after Heijun and calls out for him to wait, desperately needing a ride to escape. After completing the harrowing delivery, an angry Heijun confronts Hephaestus, complaining that he was almost killed again. The god is surprised to see him back so soon, and says he knew Heijun would get the job done in no time. Heijun retorts that Hephaestus should have told him beforehand how dangerous this particular delivery would be. Taken aback, the god says he didn't realize Heijun was being serious about nearly dying. There shouldn't have been anything particularly life-threatening in that dungeon. Hephaestus asks if Heijun sped through the delivery to get back faster, saying that really wasn't necessary. But Heijun clarifies that's not what he meant. That monster he ran into was absolutely gigantic and terrifying. Frustrated, Heijun tells Hephaestus to never mind, he'll just show him. 
He instructs the god to wait there a moment. Heijun then retrieves the celestial steel from his scooter and places the huge chunk of crimson metal down in front of Hephaestus. He exclaims, Just look at this thing! Doesn't Hephaestus think it's absolutely insane to ask him to yank something so massive and heavy out of a monster-infested dungeon? To Heijun's confusion, a shocked Hephaestus asks him what that even is. Stunned and starting to get annoyed, Heijun snaps back. What does it look like? It's obviously the celestial metal, or steel, or whatever it was that Hephaestus asked for. He sternly adds that Hephaestus better not even think about telling him he requested the wrong thing by mistake. The god clarifies, that's not what he meant. Hephaestus lifts the celestial steel into the air and explains that in all his years, he's never seen celestial steel of such immense size and purity before. He asks Heijun how in the world he managed to discover this specimen. Puzzled, Heijun isn't quite sure what Hephaestus is referring to. Seeing his confusion, the god asks him to wait a moment, saying he wants to show Heijun something. Hephaestus goes into his workshop and retrieves a piece of celestial steel. He tells Heijun that this is the largest piece of the metal he's got. The god then adds that Heijun is even more impressive than he initially thought. Hephaestus thanks Heijun for his hard work and says it seems he owes him much more than just his initial delivery fee, considering the enormous size and quality of the celestial steel he brought back. Hephaestus told Hajun that it would be silly to just cut out a piece of the celestial steel and give back the rest. Hajun, feeling very grateful and amazed, kneeled down and bowed to Hephaestus to say thank you. Hephaestus smiled at him and said he didn't need to do all that and told Hajun to stand up. But Hajun couldn't get up because his legs were too shaky and wobbly. While this was happening, back on earth at the Yongwan Guild, the guildmaster was watching a news report. It said that part of the Sori mines in Suwon had collapsed after a mysterious earthquake shook them. Luckily, no one was hurt. People started wondering if the sudden quake might mean there were new mutants appearing, or dungeons breaking open. The guildmaster turned off the TV and asked Doi Yun if he was alright, since it seemed like he had a really tough time. He mentioned that he heard the Sari mines were closed for now and that Doi Yun was the last one to get out. The guildmaster asked Doi Yun what occurred in the mines. Doi Yun described seeing a huge golem and the same guy on the scooter that they had spotted before in Tartarus. The guildmaster was very surprised to hear that they had run into this scooter guy in both Seoul and now Suwon too. Doi Yun added that the strange part was the giant golem seemed to be going after the scooter man. Hearing this, the guildmaster said they should probably look into who this scooter guy is. Based on what happened in the mines and before in Tartarus, he thought the man could be a very skilled hunter operating in secret. Doi Yun happily volunteered to investigate, saying he was perfect for the job. He had made note of what model scooter the man named Ha Jun was riding, and his license plate number. Doi Yun had also already gotten footage from the black boxes of vehicles near the mine entrance. The guildmaster was impressed by how thorough Doi Yun was. He asked Doi Yun to find Ha Jun and let him know the guildmaster of Yongwan wanted to meet with him. The guildmaster thought that if they could recruit Ha Jun, he would be an incredibly valuable addition to their guild. He told Doi Yun he was relieved he made it out safely, and not to be concerned about the mines being off limits, assuring Doi Yun he would take care of it. Doi Yun, feeling touched by the guildmaster's words, declared that he would follow him anywhere. The guildmaster expressed his appreciation for Doi Yun's loyalty. He then asked if Doi Yun had managed to get a hold of any celestial steel while in the mines. Doi Yun was shocked to realize that in the chaos of trying to escape, he had totally forgotten to collect any of the precious metal. At the same time, Ha Jun was still gazing at the system screen and chuckling to himself about how wealthy he was now. Even though the job was risky, he thought earning 500,000 points made it worthwhile. With so much money, he considered that maybe it was time to upgrade to a nicer place to live. Ha Jun did some mental math, figuring that the top hunters make around 30 billion won per year, not counting what they spend on equipment like his expensive pickaxe. He felt pretty good about making 45 million won from just one day of work. However, he wasn't sure how much longer he could keep avoiding all the scary monsters. Going into dungeons was really draining and exhausting every single time. Hajun wondered if there was anything good he could buy in the shop that would help him. He opened up the shop screen and started looking through the options, but he was let down by what he saw. Most of the items seemed pretty pointless or way too pricey. Even the most affordable weapon cost 10 billion won, and since they were all just copies, he doubted they would last very long. Hajun thought that maybe he should just give up fighting monsters in dungeons altogether, but then something caught his attention. It was a level 1 rider suit that said it was made for fast and safe deliveries. The description claimed the suit would let the wearer easily handle any kind of rough terrain or dangerous obstacles. It would boost the wearer's physical skills and abilities based on what level the suit was. Getting to the next level required 100,000 points. The suit could be used for 3 minutes each day. 
Seeing this, Hajun felt annoyed and wondered why the system hadn't shown him this helpful item earlier. He knew the only way to find out how well it actually worked was to get it and try it out. But it cost 50,000 points, which was a lot compared to his other purchases, even though they had come in handy. In the end, Hajun decided to buy the suit, viewing it as an investment. He figured he could earn back the points by doing more deliveries. After he purchased it, the rider's suit appeared right in front of Hajun. He was surprised, thinking to himself that there was no going back now. With only 25,000 points left after the expensive purchase, Hajun tried the suit on. It felt a little snug but also like he wasn't wearing anything at all. It didn't even feel hot. He could tell this was no ordinary suit and thought he should test out what it could do. 